What are God's qualifications for ministry? If you're planning to go into full-time ministry or part-time ministry or any kind of a ministry for the Lord, what does God expect? What are His qualifications that you have to meet before He can use you for ministry? Now, notice I did not say what are man's qualifications for ministry. You see, because when you study the Bible, you often find that man's qualifications for the ministry don't match up with God's qualifications for the ministry. God has a different idea of what he can and cannot use. And man will oftentimes take the easy way in ministry so that he can have a big fat salary and, you know, a nice retirement and everything else. And the Lord's up there saying, oh, you know, that's really not the way I planned it. That's not what it says in my word. So we're going to see what the Bible says you can expect if you're going to go into full-time ministry and what kind of people God will use what kind of personality, what kind of temperament God will use in the ministry. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Let's go there. question comes up, does God call all Christians to ministry? We're going to see what the Bible says here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You should be very familiar with this. Uh, verse if you know anything about this ministry if you've watched some of our videos 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new all right you know one of the the very best ways for you to get into ministry if you've been saved if you've been born again is oftentimes your old life that you used to have the old man there that used to be. You can show people, that's the way I used to be, and this is how I am now. This is what Jesus Christ did for my life now. All right? That's one of the best ways to witness to people, to show people that, you know, I might look like this ultra-righteous, sanctified kind of a person, and I might act like that, but I'll, let me tell you how I used to be. See, let me tell you about the old things that I used to do in my life and tell you what Jesus Christ did for me and how he saved me from that old life. That's a good thing to start out with in ministry. All right? And we're going to look at the best example of that today. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. One of the most phenomenal testimonies that you're going to read in your entire New Testament or in your entire New Testament is the apostle Paul. He certainly went through some interesting things. So let's start out here, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. It says here, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Can you say to the lost world that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners? of whom I am chief. You see, you talk to the average lost person and you say, where would you go if you died? Most will say, I believe I'd go to heaven. And you say, why? Because I've been a good person. You know the thing that'll totally blow their mind? Is if you say to them, well, I'd go to heaven, you don't want to know why? They say, why? Because I'm a rotten sinner. And if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansing me from that sin, I'd go to hell like a bullet and deserve to go. I'm the chiefest of sinners. Whew. See, somebody that's self-righteous, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear that I'm a good person, you're a good person, we're all good people. You know, God loves you, God loves me, you know, all this stuff. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Hey, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. See, because when you say, I'm a sinner, 
Christ died for me and paid for my sins, then you're basically pointing the finger at them and saying, you're self-righteous. And that's why it'll blow their mind a lot of times. See, because a lot of people think that they have to earn their way to heaven. And when you come to them and you say, no, 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 it isn't about earning your way to heaven. If you're earning your way somewhere, you're going to go to hell. You know, the wages of sin is death. But you come to them and you say, the, the very best that you can do will land you in hell. And you've got to come to God as a sinner. And he'll save you in that sin. That right there will blow their mind. But now I want you to look at verse 12 there. Notice three things there. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. Notice that God enabled Paul by teaching him and giving him his talents. If I say, uh, I want you to go fight that forest fire over there. Okay. And you say, well, uh, how do I do it? Well, just go. You know, you'll, it'll come to you. Well, that's not very good. Now, if I give you a fire suit and I give you fireproof boots and things and I say, here's a shovel, here's a backpack, you know, water tank and stuff like this and, and you know, whatever else. And I, a shovel, or did I say a shovel already? You know, a saw, an axe, you know, whatever forest fire fighting tools that you need. If I enable you for that, now you can go and you can do it. You can do the work that's before you. And if you're going to go into ministry... It has to be God that enables you. God has to give you wisdom. The Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. In the book of James. So, you go to God and he enables you for the ministry. He gives you certain gifts. We're going to see that as we continue today. Notice the second part here. For that he counted me faithful. Did you know if you're going to be in God's ministry... You're going to have to be faithful. You can't back down on your stands. You're going to have to take your stands and stick by them and be found faithful. You know, you can't be wishy-washy. You can't be double-minded. You have to be faithful. You take a stand for this book right here, this King James Bible, and you say, this is God's Word. Well, what about Acts 8.37? It wasn't in the oldest and best manuscripts. And you go... Oh, well, uh, well, I'd have to reject the King James there, I guess, because scholarship says I should. You know, see, you're not faithful. No, you have to say, you come back and you say, the oldest and best manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, they're not the best, and they're not the oldest. Okay, first of all. Secondly, why would better manuscripts remove a verse that proves that you don't baptize infants? Okay, you baptize adults according to their consent. After, after they get saved. See, gee, I wonder who would want to take a verse like that out. Maybe people that baptize infants, like the Roman Catholics, which is why that verse has been removed from their manuscripts. Huh? What a coincidence, you know? See, there are answers out there, and if you are a faithful Christian, then you're going to find the answers that support this book. You're not going to quit on the book. You're not going to say, well, I used to be King James only, you know, but I, I, I quit because there were too many things I couldn't answer. You know, you aren't going to quit on the Lord. You're going to stay faithful. So first of all, God has to enable you. He has to give you the wisdom that you're going to use for ministry. Secondly, you're going to have to prove that you're faithful to the Lord. You're going to have to prove that you're going to stay by the Lord, that you have convictions that you're not willing to compromise. Now let's look at the third thing there in verse 12. And this is very important, important here. Read the whole verse. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, Christ Jesus our Lord there, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Notice Paul does not say, I went through the proper seminary training and therefore was ordained by my local church to be put into the ministry. He didn't say that. He said it was the Lord that put him into ministry. And we're going to see that today in this study. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Now, when Jesus came here to the earth, what did he pick? Twelve disciples. And those disciples are also, also called apostles at one point in time. Okay, now there were many disciples, but I don't believe that there were more than twelve apostles. Right? Now what happened? 
Well, you have Judas Iscariot was the one that betrayed Jesus Christ, and then he goes out and he commits suicide. And so now there's 11 apostles. And the Lord basically has told them before he goes up there in Acts chapter 1, the, the first part, he tells them, you know, to wait for me and the Holy Ghost will come upon you and, and things and, and then I'll show you what you should do. So they get a little bit impatient and they say, well, we got to pick a 12th apostle, you know. And so let's look at this. Acts chapter 1, verse 23. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Okay? Now, notice there, it's kind of funny. They pick, they themselves picked two men. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. So they pick Justice and Matthias. And then they say, okay now, Lord, you show us which one of these two, it's, you know, it's up to you. It's your choice, Lord. Just which one of these two that we chose is the 12th apostle. And, you know, it's just like you can see the Lord up there going, I didn't pick either one. <laughs> You guys picked them. And then, you know, it's like, you, you know, Lord, you show us, and then we're going to cast lots. And, you know, and then, you know, whoever gets the, the long straw or something like that, you know, uh, he's the guy that, that we pick or whatever. You know, they cast lots for these two men. Um, was God really involved in that? No. And it's interesting because Matthias, the 12th apostle appointed by men, not by the Lord. The twelfth apostle there, uh, not nah, he wasn't really the twelfth apostle, but the one that they chose, this is the last time you ever hear of him. You never hear of Matthias doing anything else in your entire New Testament. No more mention of Matthias. Hmm, I wonder why. Maybe it's because God wasn't the one that chose him. You know, there's a lot of men that are in ministry today that God never chose for ministry. They have an attitude, they have arrogance, they have a know-it-all attitude, they're novices, you know. They don't really know the Bible, they're not humble, they're not submissive, they're not faithful to the things of the Lord. They come in with their Alexandrian philosophies, with their new Bible versions, and their modern CCM music and everything else, and they say, I'm a preacher. I'm recognized, I'm a recognized pastor because I'm ordained and I have a, a license to preach. And the Lord's up there saying, Half of you guys aren't even saved, you know, not even half. I mean, I'd say a lot more than half. A lot of these guys are not even Christians. And yet they've been chosen by men for the service of the Lord, and God never did a thing with them and never will do a thing with them. All they can do is build big church buildings and fill them full of lost carnal people like themselves. That's all they do. Be very careful down here who you believe is in ministry, who you see, you know, some guy and you say oh he's a pastor he's clergy you know oftentimes God hasn't chosen them for anything all right now I'm just going to address something here while we're here because I know some of you are probably going but there were more than 12 apostles there are more than 12 apostles you know and I'm going to address this issue right now because this is something that's been brought up in the past and you know people will say they'll point to a specific verse which we're going to go to here in a minute and they'll say that there were more than 12 apostles. So Matthias could have been one, and Paul was one, and, and there was all these different guys. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. Okay, first of all, because there in verse 26 it says he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Well, then there's obviously just 11 apostles, and he was supposed to be the 12th. All right, and I'm going to show you why, you know, there's a significance there to the number 12th. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 14, verse 14. Here's where they'll take you. They'll say, what about Acts chapter 14, verse 14? It's very obvious that there's another apostle here. Acts 14, verse 14 says here, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. And they'll say, see? They'll say, see? Barnabas and Paul and it says the apostles Barnabas and Paul 
Yeah, but you see, every single little part of your King James Bible is important. Notice that there is a comma between apostles and Barnabas and Paul. Now, see, I believe if you read this thing in its proper context there with that, that comma, I believe that there were other apostles present. Now, I realize that Paul and Barnabas were the ones that these pagan people were calling. Uh, see, back here in verse uh, 12, they say they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. So, these people were, were worshiping Paul and Barnabas, but that doesn't mean it was just Paul and Barnabas that were there. There could have been other apostles there that rushed in among these people and were trying to stop them from worshiping Paul and Barnabas. See, if you had to prove this thing in a court of law, unless you're there as an eyewitness, you could not prove that there were not other apostles there. There could have been other apostles present. And I believe that there were. All right? And you say, why is that? Well, let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 21. And here's the verse that disproves this whole thing that there were more than 12 apostles. Revelation chapter 21, verse 14. Okay, it says here, And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, if, the, if Barnabas was one of the apostles, and that would have been a number 13 apostle, and Matthias would have been number 14 or whatever, you know, uh, Matthias 11, Barnabas, uh, or no, I'm sorry, Matthias would be 12, Barnabas 13, Paul 14, and then there's more and more and more. If that's true, then why is the names, the names there of the 12 apostles of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 21? Why would those there be specifically 12 apostles? See, it doesn't work. There are 12 apostles. And you say, you know, what about this thing of Barnabas? Well, let me ask you a question. Where in the King James Bible does Barnabas ever perform any of the sign gifts of the apostles? Where is Barnabas ever called an apostle? You know, the apostle Barnabas, or Barnabas the apostle, or something like that. You say, well, Acts 14, 14. Well, again, you have to deal with that comma there. See, I don't believe that. I don't believe it works out. Let me show you another thing here. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. Revelation 2, chapter 2, verse 2. It says here, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and, hast, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. You mean that there's a way that you can test to see if somebody is an apostle? Mm hmm Absolutely. You see, somebody can say that they're an apostle, and there's lots of charismatics that do it today. I'm going to show you one here in just a little bit, give you a little warning about him. But there are a lot of charismatics today that are calling themselves apostles. But you see, they can't be apostles. And I'm going to show you why not. Turn to Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Did Paul actually call himself an apostle? Yes. I'll just go ahead and answer it before we even get to the scripture here. Galatians chapter 1 verse... Wait a second, where are we at here? Galatians 1 verse 10. I'm sorry, 1 verse 1. I had that written wrong. I was thinking it didn't sound right. Galatians chapter 1 verse 1. It says here, Paul an apostle not of men, neither by man. Remember that we read earlier? But by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. See, what Paul's actually doing there is he's giving a little jab at Matthias. Now, I don't think he was being mean-spirited or whatever, but anybody that was coming out saying, I'm an apostle, you know, I don't know how long Matthias was trying to claim to be an apostle after they had chosen him by casting lots, but the fact is, he was chosen by man not by the Lord. The Lord did not choose Matthias to fill that 12th apostle position. He chose Paul. Very important to understand that. Turn next to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. Okay, he says here, I am become a fool in glorying, ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. He was not behind the very cheapest, chiefest apostles. Okay? In other words, he had the same things there in his life that the very chiefest apostles had. We're going to see this as we continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 7-9, through 9, I'll just read here quick. It says, After that he was seen of James, speaking about Jesus Christ, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now that's very significant right there. You see, the true test of an apostle in your King James Bible is, they have to be an eyewitness of seeing Jesus Christ after his resurrection. Hmm. You know, verse 7 there again, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And then Paul says, then he was also seen of me on the road to Damascus there. See, that's the qualification to be an apostle according to Scripture. You have to see Jesus Christ. All right? After his resurrection. Now these liars today that are going around saying that they're apostles, they haven't seen Jesus Christ. You know, they see some angelic being that's radiating light or something like this in their bedroom or some other place. They have a vision or something like that. They're probably seeing the angel of light himself, you know, Satan, Lucifer. And they're so deceived that uh, they're thinking it's Jesus Christ. You know, Joseph Smith saw this, you know, Jesus guy. And uh, a lot of these false prophets, a lot of these lost devils are seeing this angelic being. You know, they're seeing Satan. And they're confusing it and saying that they're seeing Jesus Christ. And the whole world's going to be seeing that same thing here very soon. When the body of Christ leaves, they're going to see this Christ guy show up and it's going to be the Antichrist. So, very interesting. But these 12 apostles all had to be eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus Christ. They had to see him. But let's continue here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. I'll notice this one. First of all, you have the eyewitness there account. People, these apostles have to be eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. Secondly, verse 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The signs of an apostle? Hmm. Interesting. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. It doesn't say that they'll recover if they give enough money or if they pray with enough faith or some other nonsense, like the modern charismatics do. They lay hands on the sick, the sick recover right there. See, first of all, the apostles have to be eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. Secondly, they have to have the sign gifts of the apostles. It's right there. Let me show you a picture here of a false apostle. And this guy here, you got to watch out for this guy. Here you have the Spirit of Prophecy Church. And there you have Apostle Senior Pastor Stan Johnson. If you don't know who that is, that's Stan Johnson. It doesn't have his name listed there. But Stan Johnson and his wife, they're uh, Leslie Johnson. She's also a senior pastor and a prophetess. Isn't that nice? And then their daughter, you know. And, you know, they're all in ministry. Preachers. Sure they are. Uh -huh. And Stan Johnson puts out some of the most kooky, nonsense, idiotic videos out there. He is solidly post-trib. Yeah, he says he defends the King James, but, you know, you might defend the King James, but not be able to rightly divide it and not be able to read it <laughs> with, you know, just understand the plain English of the King James Bible. And this Stan Johnson guy, he gets all these weirdo charismatics in there. They're seeing angels. They're calling angels into the room to touch people and stuff. And they're, they're having visions and, you know, people laying down and falling down and all this satanic nonsense that they're doing. You know, and the guy is totally about money. Do a little bit of research into Stan Johnson. You know, 
check out his partaker program where you have different levels you know according to different precious metals you have your copper your silver your gold partaker and your platinum partaker i think back when i used to see you know checked into it it was like twelve hundred dollars a month you know to be in this platinum partaker program yeah okay you know and uh, hurricane katrina i remember hit and uh this is you know back when that thing hit years ago and uh, Stan Johnson sent out this letter and he was like, I know that people are suffering right now, but you have to remember that we're trying to build the kingdom of heaven down here on the earth. And, uh, you know, to do that, we have to have money. So don't let your giving, you know, go down in the recent crisis and all this stuff. You know, make sure you send your money to Prophecy Club. Yeah. Okay. You know, these false apostles are about money. And you see, they can't truly do the two signs of a real apostle. Number one, they were not eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ the resurrected Christ. Number two, they couldn't do these sign gifts of the apostles if their life depended on it. Yeah, they can fake it. They can go into their little building that they call a church and they can lay hands on people and whack them on the forehead and they fall over and all this other nonsense. You know, ridiculous. They can put on their little fake program and they can pick up deadly snakes and all this other stuff, you know. And they always pick a snake that's not really that poisonous or something, you know. I mean, why don't you go pick up a, some kind of a, you know, some of these vipers from Africa and stuff like that, that, you know, the two-step and, you know, snakes that they say you get bitten two steps later, you fall down dead, you know. I mean, pick up some really deadly snakes sometime, you know. Well, they won't do that. And how about drinking any deadly thing and it not hurting them? You know, I'd like to see Apostle Stan take a bottle of Drano, you know, from the store, sealed and everything, Take a bottle of Drano and drink the whole thing, and we'll see if it doesn't hurt him. You know. Sure. How about get a film crew and take old Stan Johnson, the Apostle Stan, or any of these other Apostle wing nuts, take him down to a hospital and say, that guy there in the wheelchair, go touch him and heal him. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You can do it if you're an Apostle. And like I said, where did Barnabas ever do these things? If Barnabas was truly an apostle, can you show me some scripture where he was doing, laying hands on the sick and they were recovering, where he was drinking deadly things, where he was picking up serpents? You know, Paul did that stuff. Where does it say that Barnabas did it? See, it wasn't who men commended, it was who God commended. And Paul is the twelfth apostle. Don't fall for that nonsense that, you know, uh, well, there was more than twelve apostles. Uh, no, there weren't. That's why you see the, t the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb back in Revelation chapter 21. So I just wanted to address that thing kind of as a side issue here because that thing's been brought up before. There are 12 apostles, never any more than 12 apostles, and it's very important to understand that because you can see that man, the men there, uh, the 11 apostles actually tried to appoint somebody of their own choosing, Matthias, and God said, nope, I'm not dealing with that guy. My guy is Paul. And it took the Lord a few years, by the way, too, to appoint Paul. See, God works in different time frames than a lot of us expect him to. Sometimes people want to go into ministry right, right away, and the Lord's just, just hold on. Study a little bit. I need to put you through some things first. Now we're going to look at some of that. Turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Okay, it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Are you called into the ministry, if you're a Christian? Yes. You say, Am I, then we're all called into full-time ministry. I didn't say that. What I said is, you are called into a ministry of some kind. Now, you know, maybe you aren't called into full-time ministry in terms of, you know, instead of having a regular nine to five job, you just serve the Lord all the time. Um, I did not start out that way. I did not start out in full-time ministry. 
I started out doing a number of different things and doing ministry on the side and the ministry has grown to the point where now I have no other choice but to do the ministry full time. You say, well then you're going to do that the rest of your life? I don't know. That's up to the Lord. If it gets to a point where I get kicked off of YouTube and I get shut down off the internet, they kick in some kind of a, you know, any hate group or something like this, uh, you know, can't be on the internet or something, well then I'll figure out something else to do. Uh, either shortwave radio or, or I don't know what. We'll see. We'll see what the Lord has for me at that point. Right now, I am in full-time ministry. But I have other skills that I can do that I can earn a living. You know, I have a wife to provide for, and so I'm going to provide for her. Uh, a lot of people try to say I'm lazy because I'm in full-time ministry. That's absolute nonsense. And I've talked about that in other sermons. You know, uh, I work harder now than I've ever worked in my life. Uh, you can go to a job and you can put in your eight hours or ten hours a day and you go home. And you don't have to go back to that job until the next day. And you get the weekend off. You know, I don't get time off from this ministry. You know, I have to force myself to take time off. When you're in full-time ministry, it's a whole other thing. But we'll talk about that as we continue. Okay, but the point is there, you are called into a ministry of some kind. Some kind of a ministry of reconciliation. All right, be it putting out tracts, uh, witnessing to people, you know, go out door to door, um, internet ministry of some kind, uh, whatever. Uh, there are some people that have musical ability, you know. Uh, I, I sure wish that somebody would just, you know, somebody that could play the piano very well would take it upon themselves to just get an old hymn book and just go through that thing and play very reverently, you know, do some recordings of the old hymns. Uh, we're losing a lot of those old hymns. Uh, they're, they're kind of fading away into the, into the past, you know, and... It'd be neat to have somebody actually play the old hymns on a piano and you could sell the CDs. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, play the old hymns, put it on YouTube. You know, it'd be, it'd be great. It'd be wonderful. Play an, you know, an hour long of old hymns or something. Put it up on YouTube if you have a talent like that, if you have a musical ability. Um, there's lots of things that you can do for the Lord as a ministry of reconciliation. There's a lot of things that you can do. And exhortation to the brethren, too. You know, there are many ministries that you can do. But now you say, but Brian, I feel like I'm called to be a pastor in terms of like a, a man that actually teaches the Bible. I should say, I shouldn't say a pastor. I should say a preacher, okay? A teacher of the Word of God. I want to teach the Bible to people. I want to get my own YouTube channel, or I want to have my own ministry, make videos, or do audio recordings, get on sermon audio, get on the radio, uh, shortwave. There's a lot of different things that you can do. And you feel that you are being called into full-time ministry. What does God expect from you? Well, let's look at the right personality and temperament for truly being used of God. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What kind of person does the Lord look down and say, okay, that's the one I'm going to call. That's the one I'm going to use. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Okay, it says here, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. Okay, there is a sense in which God will call you into a ministry. It isn't a thing of you just go out and you get the qualifications that man has for you and you say, I'll call myself into the ministry. No. Some people just don't have that, that real urgent, you know, they'll, they say, oh, I'm just going to go witness and stuff, but I, I like my job. You know, things are going well. I can support good ministries with the money that I make. Um, whatever. They don't, they don't feel that calling on their life. But if you have felt that call to go into full-time ministry, um, and you're saying, I just really have this passion there. I just, I really have this drive. I just want to, I just want to preach the word of God. I just want to tell people. And you know, you're in an area, and there's just no ministry at all in the area. You know, there's nobody putting out tracts. There's nobody preaching on the street. There's just nothing. 
you're in a dead area, you see people going to hell all around you, and you're just, you're just inside, you're just going, ah, I gotta tell these people. I gotta, I gotta, man, there's such a calling here. Okay, well, who's God gonna choose for that? Well, it says there, not many wise men after the flesh. If you're highly educated, God might call you, but uh, there's a good chance he's not going to call you. And we're going to see why here as we continue. Not many mighty. God's not going to choose you if you're very popular and very wealthy and very you know, strong and everything else. A lot of times God won't choose somebody like that either. Not many noble. There again, if you have a higher place and position, if you are very much respected and revered by people, a lot of times God won't choose somebody like that. Who does he choose? Let's continue. Verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? Verse 29, That no flesh should glory in his presence. God does not want you taking credit for something that he has done. That's why when the Lord does something through your ministry, it should come as a surprise. And I'll say this, I'm still shocked by the fact that the Lord has used me. I went into ministry years and years and years ago expecting to fail. I had a calling on my life. I was just, I was just dying inside. I mean, I'm, I'm going to these Baptist phallus houses and, uh, you know, I'm going in there, and it's just like they're not preaching the Word. They're not defending the King James Bible. These guys, I've talked to them in person, they don't believe the King James Bible is God's perfect Word. And I'm just like, ugh, inside, just like, they're not telling the truth. They're staying away from the conspiracy issues. They're not, they're not, they don't have the guts, apparently, to, to risk doing something that may, might make them look bad in the eyes of the world. And I'm inside, I'm just screaming, I'm just like, Lord, give me a chance. And the Lord gave me that chance. And I thought, well, I'm just going to preach the word and, and it's probably not going to go too far. And, you know, at first it didn't. At first, you know, it was just like I'd get, you know, five views on a video or something like that. And it was like, well, hey, you know, praise the Lord, five views. You know, and, and all of a sudden I have these people and they're writing me and they're saying, you know, boy, you really did a good job on that sermon or something like that, and the Lord really blessed me through your ministry, I'm going, huh? Me? You know? And I can tell you right now, I have no natural ability to do what I'm doing right now. It's The Lord has brought me to this point. And I'm going to show you as we continue with this study what the Lord will do with your life to get you to the point where He's using you. And I don't want to get ahead of myself too much here, but the fact is, God will put you through experiences so that you can use those in ministry. But, again, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Jump down to, jump down to chapter 2 there in 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 1. It says here, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, notice that, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, if you've watched these videos, you know that my speech is not with enticing words of man's wisdom. I have a very hard time with the English language. And you say, oh, what's your native language? English. <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of times I have little idioms and little things that I say, and I, I mess up words, and I, I go back and I'm listening to an older sermon, and I go, why on earth did I say that? That's not even the right word. You know, I am very, I am not very good with my speech many times. Uh, I just, a lot of times I just come out with it, and sometimes people perceive that as being rude and, and arrogant, and whatever. I'm not really trying to be rude or arrogant. I just, I believe in just telling it like it is. And I'm not going to gloss over things and come out with all kinds of big words and try to speak in a way that you'll really be moved emotionally. I'm just not going to do it. You know, I know what the Bible says. I know what is going on in the world, and I'm just going to present it to you. And, you know, that's the right 
kind of way to do things. Okay, that's the way the Apostle Paul did things. He didn't come with these enticing words of man's wisdom and, and say, Dearly beloved, we are here today to open the Scriptures that the Lord might illumine us with His wisdom in this fine day when we can, you know, no, wrong, you know. Hey, let me tell you something. It is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's going to offend most people right there. And you look a lot of what Paul wrote there, you know, it's offensive. You know, it's a lot of what Jesus Christ said when he was here on the earth. You know, you're a whited sepulcher, you know, full of dead men's bones. I mean, you realize who he's saying that to? These guys, the Pharisees, the doctors of the law, the PhDs, you know, the THDs, these men who are the big shots in the synagogues, you know, Rabbi so-and-so, oh, it's such an honor to have you here. And here comes this homeless Jew, and it's a carpenter, and he comes in and he says, hey, you're a whited sepulcher. You appear outward beautiful to men, like a whited sepulcher there, but inwardly you're full of dead men's bones. Hypocrite, serpent, generation of vipers. That's offensive. But see, the Lord laid, made an example that we could follow. And the Apostle Paul followed that example, and we can learn from what the Apostle Paul did. That's the right kind of person that the Lord will use.